thank you for this opportunity to speak here in this uh, amazing venue. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the work we do in my research group on yeast. Uh, so we do engineering at all sorts of different scales uh, on synthetic biology systems in yeast in probably about two-thirds of the work in my group. Um, I was going to build up to some of our stuff and eventually talk about work on the synthetic genome project with yeast, but Jeff is coming after me and he's going to give a, a much more detailed talk on that. So I'll probably concentrate a little more on uh, some of the stuff at the circuit level and maybe at the um, individual gene level in terms of using modularity as, as a process. And maybe if there's time, I'll, I'll talk about um, some other work we've done that answers that sort of answers more some of the questions that were posed yesterday. So the, my group generally works on foundational tools, a whole variety of different things, with an aim to try and make um, engineering of biology more predictable and something a bit more akin to an engineering discipline. And we started now moving to apply some of these tools in different areas, diverse areas, such as uh, materials production and therapeutics production in particular. We kind of see that within nature, there is some level of modularity. Most genes are considered as modules. You see operons as modules. And these scale as you build up chromosomes built from these various modules. And so we can also see comparisons, and this is from a, a Ron Weiss a review paper, with how modularity allows sort of scaling of complexity in other disciplines, and how you can also see that naturally in biology. I'm not a firm believer that these modular rules exist, and they're never going to be broken. Biology is very good at finding ways to break rules. But I still think that as we do work in synthetic biology and construct at different levels, being able to use modularity gives us a lot of power and enables us to really progress in the subject very quickly. So I first started getting involved in synthetic biology in Jim Collins's lab back then at Boston University. And what we did was work with modular parts, uh, rewiring them into different circuits. And you can see here a couple of different circuits we published on. Um, one of them being a feed-forward loop network and one of them being a, a bistable toggle switch, which allowed us to look at how noise is it influences in um, differentiation of cells. Both of the networks you'll see here um, contain pretty much the same parts and the same modules, promoters that are regulated at different times uh, by different regulators, bacterial regulators in this case, that we've moved over into yeast and placed in the yeast genome. And by just simply changing the topology of the interactions of these regulators, we could get different effects, which is kind of a way where just with a very limited number of parts, we can get a lot of different diversity in the behavior of yeast. And so just to give you run through one of the examples of these uh, projects, we wired up uh, these two bacterial repressors against one another in, a, in a, what is effectively a leaky bistable switch system. And this became a way to program in predictably uh, the timed um, message within the cells of gene expression turning on it after a certain period of time. So we call these kind of like slow release genetic timers. So just to talk through this network design here, we have two uh, regulated promoters that are producing two bacterial repressors. Uh, these repressors, when expressed, will repress the expression of their opposite repressor so that you have either one, system uh, one side of the system dominating or the other. But because this is a leaky system, almost always the TET R side of the system would dominate unless you came in and gave a signal to the cells, which was anhydrotetracycline. You could also give doxycycline, which blocks TET R from binding on its repressor and will then instead see the system start producing more LACI. So you can see here in our normal system, we start the cells. They immediately revert to their favored scenario where TET I dominates. TET R dominates the system. We add anhydrotetracycline for a period of time, and then we can wash it off the cells. That has flipped them into being a lacai dominated system. And then over a period of time, due to the, the leakiness of some of the promoters here, you end up with the system slowly reverting back, in this case, over about two days worth of continual yeast cell growth. So that's many generations of yeast. So this is a message that they're passing on to their progeny, not by changes in the DNA. So it's a form of epigenetic memory passing down. And so this system very much works like if you had a switch on the wall and you flipped it up and then it, it slowly went tick, 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 tick over a period of time and then went down. And we could plug this in to our yeast and see GFP levels change as the population grew. We then re realized that because the nature of how this um, time of reset was to do with how much leakiness there was in expression from the promoters and how, how well they were controlled, 
if we did point, if we did uh, general mutation of regions of the core of these yeast promoters, we could get a whole library of promoters that led to different expression levels, but also different leakage of expression. Uh, and we could then use these different um, regulated promoters in our system, and we could take data from this part library, put it in together with the prototype data from the initial version of the network we made, and we could use something, we could use predictive modeling to kind of work out different reset times from different combinations of, of modular parts we're putting together. So the way we do that is quite straightforward. We build our network, we do mutation uh, within specific regions of the promoters to get our promoter library. We characterize the promoter library for both their output, how much they produce when unregulated, and their, and their um, kind of their input, which is how repressed they are um, when tet rr lac i is overexpressed. And this data can then be fed into a predictive model, and this was done by Zhao Wang in um, Jim Collins' group. And we can then look to see when we have different combinations from these part libraries, how long the reset time of this gen these genetic timers would be. And this, these blue lines are the prediction space for these things, and the red lines were actually when we went and took a few of these combinations together and then measured the reset times, this is what we got. Some of them nearing almost a week of exponential growth before the reset gets all the way back to normal. This is a good example of how modeling can be used in synthetic biology projects, especially circuit, circuit projects like this. Um, we had three promoter nodes in our system here, and we had 20 promoters in our, each of the promoter libraries that could go in here, so we could have produced 8,000 possible networks. That actually could be done probably now by PhD students uh, in, in good groups with good tools, but back in uh, the late 2000s when I was doing this work, that would have been a, a hell of a lot of effort by me and Jim's lab with the basic tools that were available. So it's really nice then that by having a predictive model, we can then use that to define a small number to build rather than have to build very large numbers. These networks were only controlling uh, GFP expression, so we wanted to show that they could be used for something slightly more interesting. And we managed to uh, discuss with Kevin Verstrappen's group, who was then at Harvard, about a, an interesting gene flow one, which when uh, knocked out um, of yeast or, or underexpressed in yeast, the yeast grow normally, they, uh, you know, they float around within the liquid perfectly fine, but when you overexpress it in cerevisiae yeast, you really start to get tight binding of the cells to one another, and this is because it's this protein which forms on the outer surface of the yeast cells and acts like Velcro, getting cells to start linking together. We call this process flocculation. And so when you get enough cells flocculating within a population, they then have a gravity, and so they then sediment down, and you end up coming in in the morning and seeing this pellet at the bottom of your tube, and actually, if you go to the microscope, you often see very, very tightly packed yeast cells, sometimes even looking like hexagonal. When I wanted to get microscope images in the lab, sometimes I would have to be fishing these pellets out and then smashing them and breaking them off with pipette tips to be able to get some that I could see under the microscope. So this is a really cool natural glue that yeast has. So we linked up our timer switches to this system, and now the different timers uh, with combinations of different promoters in the key nodes of the, of the circuits can now give us uh, sedimentation and pellet formation within our exponentially growing cultures at different predicted times, and again going on one here almost a week afterwards. So this was a nice way where we could tie in a really interesting phenotype of yeast uh, with genetic timers that we'd built and we'd use predictive modeling, and we could get new kind of phenotypes seen and control of that as well. We've been kind of pushing that a little further in my research group, inspired by a Royal College of Art fashion designer who came to our group for a few months with a wacky idea of that it would be great in the future that instead of mass manufacturing of clothes where all the clothes have the same pattern, instead you have microbes performing the patterning so that every one of these mass manufactured items of clothes has an individual pattern. So she investigated how you could grow bacteria in patterns and we got bacteria to secrete a pigment molecule as this was, as they were growing, and we even tested this out on fabrics and showed that this was okay to then autoclave and take out of the lab with this patterning. But it got us thinking about whether we could ever make patterns with the way yeast grows. So yeast normally grows, obviously, as a single cell organism, which then buds off. And then another single cell organism grows. But in a colony, what happens is they all start just growing on each other. But yeast also has, hidden away in its genome, it has the genes that allow it to do 
kinds of multicellular growth. Most of these have, been, have got now mutations within them that silence this because the lab yeast we use, we don't want to see that happening. But you can resurrect these mutations and start getting things like filamentous growth, pseudohyphal growth uh, out of yeast, things that are seen in natural yeasts and filamentous fungi. So uh, there is a poster, I think, outside here where someone else is looking into this. Is the person who's posted? Yeah. I haven't had a chance to talk to you yet, but it's super cool stuff. Um, so we, were, we then wired up these, some of these genes. Um, my PhD student uh, was very happy that one of the key genes involved is the gene PhD1. So he gets his PhD straight away with the mutation there. And then so now we have, using the same promoters that we used in the previous network, we can link up to control of flow 8, PhD1, uh, and also another one, CDK8. And so now we can have extra extracellular control of filamentous growth so that these cells, instead of growing and budding off from one another, when we hit them with specific inducers, they now grow like this, where they don't leave one another. They grow more elongated with branches coming off. So they're starting to look a little like a branch fractal, but one that we don't have much control over. So just to show you how they grow, this is kind of like a filamentous growth where we've induced this and we managed to do this in haploid strains, which was the first time people had, had done that because it's normally only seen in diploid strains. Uh, and you can see the branches come, uh, the filamentous growth coming off and occasionally branches coming off that as well. And we can put the whole system now, wire it up so it's linked to our genetic timer switches. So over a period of hours and days, you see filamentous growth initially. And then as the timers start to release the system, you'll now start seeing them start forming colonies as normal. So they start filling up in the gaps between the branches. Uh, my student George is uh, finishing off work on this. We currently have unregulated branching, which is, uh, which is great for making filaments, but actually being able to con control the pattern really requires us to be able to control the branching rate, and particularly when and where, how often you get a branch forming. So what currently happens is a cell will divide off and make the next cell, and this will make the filament. So this is, we call it in yeast, the mother cell and then the daughter cell. And what we're trying to achieve now is differential regulation between the mothers and the daughters so that the mother cells then enter a period after they've produced a daughter cell where over a certain amount of time or a certain amount of gene expression, they don't produce another daughter cell. So that prevents them making another branch. But then after maybe several hours or days, we could see that signal come back down again to allow it to then produce another daughter, and that would then produce another branch into the pattern here. So to get that, we're working very hard on uh, regulated promoters that are regulated so that they're only expressed in the mother cell and not the daughter cell, and those can be tied up to senescence genes. We have some initial uh, work there that I'm not going to show here that, that seems to show that that is working as well. That kind of piggybacks on some of the work my group did earlier on a few years ago where we looked into designing promoters from the bottom up, because what we need in that scenario is we need a promoter where we know we can have repressible, externally repressible um, expression, but we also need it that the regulation turns on in mother cells, but not daughter cells. That's a complex um, conundrum for us because we have to take regulation that is found naturally in yeast in upstream activating sequences, but we need a core promoter that can be repressed. So we're starting to have to make hybrid promoters where we're bringing in different regions from different promoters putting them together so that our logic can be like we want it to be. So we started doing work towards this end on a different set of promoters uh, a few years ago, and this was published way back in 2012 as one of the first papers from my group when we first got going five years ago. Uh, and this was, we, we looked at, could we kind of start with a very, very boring promoter that worked as a promoter so that genes would be transcribed in yeast, and then could we begin layering on our own regulation on that in a pr more predictable way, as opposed to taking init initially well-regulated promoters and trying to work with those where they have a lot of things written into their sequence which define when and where they're switched on. So we did possibly the world's most boring bioinformatics screen, which was we looked at um, thousands and thousands of uh, gene expression uh, data banks that were available online to look for uh, mRNAs that almost never changed their gene expression in lots of different conditions because we wanted something that was just on and always on. This gave us a sort of a top 10 list here. And one of them we settled on was the Profilin 1 promoter, PFY1. Uh, this produces a, a cytoskeletal protein, quite a small one. Uh, 
And what we really liked about this um, promoter, apart from being very, very constitutive in that its expression levels don't change much, is that it's also very short and very simple. It simply has a poly T track, which is bound nearby by Reb, Reb1 protein. And then it seems to leave a core promoter region here, which RNA polymerase can keep binding to and firing to just keep doing gene expression of whatever you put downstream of this gene. And so we tested that in a variety of different conditions here, and we always saw very close uh, constitutive gene expression at different times in exponential growth of yeast and in different conditions as well. And then we did this trick again that we'd done back in the, the previous work in 2008, where we mutated bases just in a very specific region um, in the core region of this promoter. And we showed that by mutating all these bases, you could select out a whole library of promoters that the slight changes in the base sequences there now lead to the promoters having different strengths, but they're all very constitutive. That also showed us, as well as giving us a library to do lots of different levels of gene expression uh, in yeast, it also showed us that there were regions within that core promoter where you could change the base sequence, you would still get output. Uh, so that means we now have a kind of an area within the promoter where we can start adding in our modules. So a simple one we did first was to add in uh, the recognition sites for the bacterial TET repressor so that this now switches from being a constitutive promoter to being a regulated promoter that is usually repressed in the presence of TET repressor. And then as you add in increasing amounts of anhydro tetracycline, you can switch this on. So this allows this now to become a regulated promoter. At the time, back in 2012, the, the new cool in vogue thing, or 2011 actually, was uh, TAL effectors. And we showed that TAL effectors, which are very modular DNA binding proteins, where you can swap out domains of the protein so that they target any, pretty much any different DNA base sequence, we could then get them to target the different uh, sections of our promoters, uh, and they would be what we call orthogonal, which is that one uh, repressor would specifically bind one promoter and switch that off, whereas the presence of another um, repressor would not interact with that promoter, and so that you would have a very defined relationship. So now we're able to scale this so that we've gone from one boring PFY1 promoter to now having multiple regulated promoters uh, with multiple regulators for each one. DNA 2.0 offered to analyze our mutation sequence from this library. Uh, they went through this sequence uh, and they have an algorithm that looks to add all the base sequences within the mutation library and what the output of that promoter was and then tells you the relative importance of every base as, as well as they can from the very small data set we provide them. And what was quite cool here is this led them to initially say to us, okay, we, we think based on this sequence analysis, we could design you a strong promoter from this relationship here. And this is the one they designed, pretty strong, not the strongest, but pretty impressive that they get to second best just with their first guess. But this also gave us much more insight into the bases that are available within this region to mutate, which ones we need to keep as a certain base uh, if we wanna maintain strong gene expression and which we can tolerate all sorts of mutations with. And so then for designing all of our further regulation, we found that there was a specific region where we could change a number of different bases as long as we kept this T and this A the same. And we could generate all sorts of different targets within that region, which could all then be individually targeted by different TAL effectors but the gene expression that would come out from the promoters would be exactly the same in every case. So that you have a whole, whole load of different regulated promoters, but they behave almost exactly the same, both when activated and when repressed. And so uh, we haven't yet published this work. We're kind of wrapping it up at the moment, uh, but this is how the orthogonality scaled. This was the six by six matrix. Ben's taken this up now to a, a 10 by 10 matrix, where you can see all the different TAL effector based repressors match and, uh, and repressed down only at the specific promoter pair that they're supposed to be with. So this gives us a whole lot of different tools to do the rewiring here. Um, just to cover, we've also done other promoter libraries here. This is constitutive promoter library. This one's based on the very strong ADH1 promoter with a whole range of mutations. And this was done in a slightly different way uh, because this is a much longer promoter region where we used highly mutagenic PCR to introduce about 10% errors into the promoters. And this again leads to a different level of expression. What was kind of cool about this was this was done 
in the same pot as doing DNA assembly to make the plasmid at the first time. And this was part of work, and we've done lots of work in my group and with Jeff Baldwin at Imperial College on different DNA assembly methods. And this showed that in using a certain method, you could, in the process of constructing your plasmid, you could say, I would like this part within the plasmid to appear as a library of mutation in the same go as you're doing the whole experiment and the assembly. So on the same day that you assemble your plasmids, you can also be defining that one position within that network or within that pathway is mutated. So DNA assembly is something we've, like I said, we've done a variety of different papers and reviews on. And I just want to now move on to talking about some of the success we've been having since we moved to a Golden Gate-based assembly. We aligned ourselves with John Duber's lab at UC Berkeley, who developed this fantastic MoClo Yeast Toolkit, which allows you to take a whole load of different modular parts, assemble them together first to make kind of a gene system, so a promoter, an open reading frame, a terminator, and then you can take multiples of those and then bring them together to make pathways or to make signaling pathways or just multi-gene systems. And the kit that you can go out and get now and add gene if you're a yeast group and you want to get using this contains a whole variety of different parts. There's about a 96 well plate is what you get. In our own lab and in John's lab, the, the, these collections have now ballooned to many hundreds of parts. And actually John sent me this slide a few, a couple of months ago looking at when his lab switched to everyone on the yeast projects using this specific framework of modular um, MoClo based assembly, the massive increase in the productivity of, of the lab in terms of how many plasmids uh, they're, they're all making. And I, I certainly think it's been the same in our lab since we moved to that about a year and a half ago. So we've been mostly using that for pathway engineering and we heard plenty about pathway engineering yesterday without having uh, Tons and tons of mass specs like uh, they do up at Manchester. Uh, we've instead been looking at pathways. It's very easy for us uh, to, to see a good output for. So um, uh, Jeff's group have been helpful in sending us over some pigment pathways. Uh, we've also been working on selectable pathways, such as the production of the antibiotic penicillin, and selectable growth pathways. A commonly uh, used one in um, yeast research is introducing the genes that allow yeast to grow on xylose, a, a lignocellulosic sugar uh, that is, it doesn't normally grow on. Penicillin is probably the one of most interest, um, and it's one that we've really enjoyed working on, and we're just wrapping up the work now as a paper. And so this is how penicillin is made. Uh, firstly, a gene condenses two amino acids and an unnatural amino acid into a molecule called ACV, which is very quickly then modified to become isopenicillin. In the peroxisome of the filamentous fungi penicillin, this is then modified uh, to make PEN-G, uh, which is then uh, secreted out of the cells uh, and is, goes out into the external media outside the penicillin chrysogeum cells. So we decided to put uh, these pathway libraries, these guys, all on a, on a plasmid uh, to add to yeast. This first gene here, the ACVS, is a type of gene called a non-ribosomal peptide, which is a assembly line uh, enzyme, which is effectively one protein, but it actually encodes multiple different enzyme subunits within it, catalyzing lots of reactions as it goes along. So you can imagine this as, as one sort of multi-modular enzyme, and as such, it's very big. It's almost bigger than any gene naturally found in the yeast genome. So it's a bit of a pain to clone because 12 KB, you, you know, PCR is kind of off the table unless you can guarantee really good accuracies. Uh, but we managed to clone this and have it under a regulated system uh, into the genome of our cells. And so that goes into one of the chromosomes. The rest of our pathway uh, goes on plasmids. And we use these modular DNA assembly kits to put in some different promoters, uh, different versions of the uh, open reading frames that encode the enzymes, adding on tags and different uh, three prime UTR or terminator sequences because that can also affect gene expression in yeast. And when we put all these together, combine them first into their individual gene plasmids, and then assemble them into a final yeast pathway plasmid, we can start getting our cells producing uh, penicillin. So firstly, this is the pure chemical standard, and the mass spec trace shows that that big gene on the enzyme is working. So we get the non-ribosomal peptide synthetase working in yeast, and it produces the first uh, part of the system, which is ACV. And then the rest of the pathway then allows us to get PEN-G production. And what's really great about this actually is that the PEN-G is highest 
in the external media because as well, S. cerevisiae is secreting this out naturally. So we find much more of the um, penicillin G in our growth media of our yeast than in the actual cells themselves. Which, so that makes life very easily. And what was great about the Moclo yeast toolkit in this system was that the yeast toolkit included uh, localization tags to send certain uh, enzymes into compartments. And one of those was uh, the uh, peroxisome targeting tags. So for example, it, we, when we got the kit from John's group, we immediately, Ali immediately uh, stuck um, fluorescent reporters with um, these sequence tags on the end and turned on the gene PEX11, which causes overexpression of, uh, of peroxisomes in the cells. And we could see all of these uh, expression now of uh, these proteins, these enzymes being sent into the peroxisomes and many more large peroxisomes in our cells. And that really helped us boost the yields in our pathway and especially boost the yields we were getting in the extracellular media as well, because so much more of the reactions are occurring now in big peroxisomes that are fusing and leaving, uh, leaving our yeast. We've also slightly improved in the last uh, few months uh, this Moclo CRISPR system, uh, Moclo system to include CRISPR. So now we have a very fast uh, protocol in the group for putting in um, a variety of different things into the cell at the same time and at the same time making changes on the genome. And what happens here is this is so efficient now that you do not need any uh, selectable markers on the things that you're integrating in because in yeast, the CRISPR is cutting the genome until you fix the sequence there so that sequence doesn't exist. Then all the cells that can't repair that sequence are gonna die. And you then provide in donor sequence, maybe the gene that you wanna add in or the mutation you wanna put in to the, uh, to the yeast chromosome. And that will repair in very efficiently because yeast is very good at homologous recombination. And so then you will end up with all your changes. So uh, Will first go trying this whole protocol. He had greater than 90% success rate with no selectable markers doing simultaneous two deletions and two insertions into the genome. So this is now scaling up. And so the sort of things that people in my group, Will is just a first year PhD student. He's now doing things like looking at signal signaling pathways, looking at doing multiple knockouts of different components at the same time as putting in refactored um, uh, components now with a whole variety of different promoters to change the gene expression of the components in a singling pathway. And so in, in a one-shot one experiment here, as an example, he knocked out four genes on the genome and added two more genes back in, but under a, a library of different promoters and was able to pick out colonies that then maintain the signaling system, so they still respond to MF alpha, this mating factor, so that increased mating factor leads to increased expression from the reported gene. Not quite the same as wild type, it's a bit more leaky, but if you see, if you haven't added these genes back in, the whole thing is constitutively on. And so this is pretty impressive because this is six different changes going on in just a, in a one week, in a one pot reaction in the cell. So the last thing I was gonna talk about on yeast was the modular yeast, yeast genome, synthetic yeast, but uh, I'm gonna let Jeff give you the whole introduction here. But I just wanna point out that um, the reason why I call it the modular, modular yeast genome and why I'm so interested in working on it is because it has this recombination system written into the chromosomes that I'll go into in a second. Our lab is involved in building one of the chromosomes, chromosome 11 with the um, kind of scary number of 666 kilobase pairs in size. And uh, I'm happy to report that um, we've got all of our DNA. It gets synthesized for us by GNOT and gets sent like this. It's very boring. It's just a FedEx package that costs about the same as a small car. <laughs> and then uh, Ben in my group, uh, with the assistance of Maureen, has been putting this together. And 76% of the synthetic DNA is now integrated into our chromosome, so we're nearly done. And you can see our progress on our, um, our resource webpage along with the progress of some of the other chromosomes in the project. But why I'm calling it a modular genome is because the design that uh, Jeff and others came up with was to place uh, a recombination site, LOXP-SYM, landmarked throughout all of the chromosomes, immediately downstream of all non-essential genes and at other significant landmarks. This is a recombination site where if you provide a recombinase Cree that recognizes this site and you add estradiol, which is, induces it to go into the nucleus, 
It will bind together two of these sites, link them together in a loop, and catalyze a rearrangement of the DNA, leading to either translocations, so that one part of one chromosome shifts to go to another part of another chromosome, inversions, so that a region of the genome flips over, so it's now pointing in the other direction, and also deletions, that's a very important one, the genes could be lost, and potentially as well insertions if you provide new DNA at the same time that's within this format. And so this is from one of Jeff's papers. This shows that um, the majority of the time if you have synthetic chromosomes in your cell and you induce this system, most cells are gonna die. And so the reason for that is quite obvious because they're deleting or rearranging essential genes so that the new versions of the chromosomes that arise from this recombination are not viable. So you get lethalities. But what's very cool is that many of these colonies here, there are survivors, right? So these are cells that have maybe slightly rearranged their chromosomes or even dramatically rearranged their chromosomes, but they're still viable. So the modules of the individual genes have changed, in, in, both in terms of their content, some of them might have disappeared, some of them might be present in multiple copies instead, and the arrangement of them has all shuffled around, but the cells still grow. And so I'm very excited in this because Gene expression has been shown by others to be significantly affected by the location you are in in the genome. And things like the secondary metabolite pathways like the penicillin pathway we're working on and others are often found to cluster in plants and fungi. You would have seen that from Anne Osborne's talk earlier this week. And here's an example of a metabolic pathway that's clustered through evolution in S. cerevisiae, the DAL cluster. And so the modular genome of synthetic yeast allows us to, to look at this in a way and try and understand how a genome could be laid out to do things like optimize biosynthesis. And then eventually one day, I, I would love the challenge of, of having a, a full set of parts and thinking from bottom up, not copying what nature does, how would you put these various modules together to make a viable genome from scratch? To give you an example of some of the effects of genomic positioning uh, with tools that were sent over from Jeff's group. We put in a violacin pathway in different positions around a uh, partially synthetic um, chromosome, uh, putting it in the middle of the chromosome, putting it up close to the telomeres, spreading it out so they're at either end of the chromosome, close to the telomeres. And the production of this pathway, if it's working perfectly well, violacin pathway should produce some very dark uh, purple pigmented colonies. And what you can see is certain uh, versions of these constructs do that very well. Others, the whole system doesn't work, poss possibly because of local silencing close to the telomeres. And other ones are a bit mixed. And so we even occasionally saw colonies that were half white and half pink because some sort of silencing effect was going on within that colony. Where we're going with this kind of work is that we think that the scramble plus the heterologous pathways is, is of good interest. So we could put our carotenoid pathway, pen pathway, xylose pathways in cells that have partially synthetic chromosome regions or even full synthetic chromosomes. We can induce this scrambling system and what that does is that creates a whole diversity of different yeast strains that your metabolic pathway is operating with and some of those may be more favorable. You can even, rather than construct your whole pathway, you could provide your genes as just units that are ready to be scrambled in. And we did that with the xylose uh, pathway, which is two to three genes. Uh, best if there's three, but it can survive with two. And, and we were able to do this scrambling and pick out a strain which actually started to grow on xylose media uh, because it must have inserted these genes in the genome. So where I think this is quite useful is uh, in the metabolic uh, engineering world, uh, linking that in with synthetic biology. The traditional method is quite to get high yields is quite multi-step. You would initially design and clone uh, a version of your pathway, put that in your cells, test it, and then you'll go back and start swapping in alternative genes, different promoters of different strengths to try and optimize the expression and flux of the pathway. You'll then probably take your best winners out of that, take them out, and now move them into lots of different strain backgrounds. So you might do lots of different strains that people have worked with before that show good yields in industry, or you might do, put them into knockout collections because it may be that certain genes when knocked out will help improve your pathway. And then finally, probably the one that in industry really matters is optimizing the growth conditions for scale up. And so all these tools, the modular DNA assembly with promoter libraries, part libraries, plus um, the synthetic yeast, 
can really narrow this down so that this whole process can all be done. So you can have one pot assembly of many thousands of versions of a pathway, and you can have one pot strain evolution so that your, your best pathways here can then be just scrambled so that the, all of these different strains are created in the same pot, and you can then look for those as long as you've got a good selection uh, system, and you can go straight up to uh, optimizing conditions to get your better yield. And this is part of a, um, a project that uh, uh, I had fun I've got funding for at the moment where I, I tried very hard to get a really good acronym for my project. So this is it, Automatic Chromosome Rearrangement for Optimizing Novel Yeast Metabolism. I was very glad the funders saw that as a good acronym. <laughs> and uh, a lot of these methods that we're developing, we're going to be teaching uh, next summer at a Synthetic Genome Engineering Summer School uh, that I encourage you to send your students or yourselves or ask your supervisors to go for. It'll be heavily discounted, so it'll be very good value. Five-day residential summer school up in Edinburgh, looking at things like CRISPR-mediated integration, synthetic yeast chromosomes, scrambling evolution, and uh, it's going to then lead on to a brilliant uh, uh, two-day conference on synthetic genomes and synthetic yeast, which Jeff will give a mention of. Uh, and uh, a final thing I would like to shout out is that there is still time if you uh, have researched that uh, Patrick Tsai up in Edinburgh and myself are um, asking for people to send in uh, European-based research. Uh, to a special issue of ACS Synthetic Biology. Uh, this was originally with a deadline of December, but they've extended that now, so you can get it in by about mid-January. So let me know if you're interested in sending in any research. So I'll just wrap up now, because I guess I'm almost out of time, uh, and thank my group. Uh, this is most of us um, proving that the, uh, the density of rock is significantly more than the density of humans. <laughs> So whatever we do, we can't unbalance this rock up here on the top of a mountain in Wales. Uh, and I particularly want to highlight uh, the people whose work I spoke on. Um, ben, ben, who worked on the Tal Effector and the Promoter Library stuff, and who's also now leading the work on the synthetic yeast chromosome. George, who's been working on the um, pattern formation with the yeast colony growth from filamentous form. Uh, and I'd also like to particularly mention Ali, who did, who's doing all the work on the penicillin pathway. And the collaborators here, and especially I'd like to thank Jeff, a great collaborator as well, and my funders. So thank you. Okay, we can take a couple quick uh, questions for Tom, and then we'll take a five-minute break before we have uh, Jeff's talk. Right, so uh, I was interested by what you said about the, the position, the genes that encode the secondary uh, metabolite uh, Path, pathways. They often cluster in the subtelomeric area, and this is, as you mentioned, is known to uh, to correspond to science regions in, in general. However, it has been shown, at least in the case of uh, low-level irradiation, that uh, uh, some stresses will rip off the telomeres from the nuclear envelope and will in, end up in um, reducing the silencing, that is, in overexpressing over the subtelomeric and telomeric genes. So that, in some sense, uh, could it be, first of all, could it be that, uh, that chemical stress, or has it been shown that chemical stress Will induce uh, will induce this uh, response uh, by inducing the pathways of secondary metabol metabolites like the ones you mentioned. Is it known? And and second of all, um, is it possible that uh, or do your data speak to this uh, phenomenon? You have shown that you have put your pathway uh, genes at different positions. Could it be interpreted? Could the results be interpreted in, in, a, in a way that says uh, that uh, they are induced, they are, they are silenced near the telomeres, and that they are induced by uh, any type of stress? Okay, so it's a really good question. I've, I've not heard that hypothesis before. So there's, it's, I speak with Anne Osborne about this quite a bit. Um, there are generally a couple of hypotheses why. You have clustering of secondary metabolite pathways in things like the plant genomes and the filamentous fungal genomes. And so one of them is deemed evolution. Uh, 
that by having these genes in the subtelomeric regions where you're more likely to get crossovers between chromosomes, it leads to quicker evolution of new secondary metabolites. Another one is co-regulation. It's obviously you don't want the secondary metabolite to be continually expressed because they're often very stressful for the cells. So it'd be nice to have them in an area where it's easy to co-regulate and silence the whole one. I think your hypothesis that adding a stress that then turns that on is a, is a very good idea as well. That would, I could also see that being a benefit. The problem is I, d I don't think anyone has studied that because these pathways are where they're naturally seen is in hard to grow, hard, hard to work with filamentous fungi and with plants as well. So those kind of experiments are very difficult. So one of the main reasons we're doing this project, this acronym project, is to put in a selectable secondary metabolite that the cell might use to defend itself in a way, which is what some of these secondary metabolites in the plant systems are, so the production of an anti antibiotic, so that it can then compete with bacteria that are in the growth media. And so that we have a system then with, in yeast, which is very tractable, where we can then start to ask a whole load of these questions to see whether these things are, you know, are good. Can we have the whole thing repressed in terms of its expression and then induce a stress and we will see more survival. That's something we could test. That's a really nice idea. So just as a follow-up, I would like to, to, to make it clear. Uh, it's a fact that uh, low-level irrigation rips off the uh, and, and uh, overexpresses the uh, subtelomeric genes. This is a fact. Cool. The hypothesis is that it could happen with other types of stresses and I have no idea. Okay. Concerning the transformation, would it be possible to use the flocculation for forming two-dimensional patterns instead of the pseudo right work? Um, I think so. Uh, I think uh, when we started that project, we looked at a, a variety of different things, and we just saw that the pseudohyphal growth was very kind of close to where we wanted to get to anyway, which was these branch fractals. So we, we stuck with that. But yeah, flocculation is a fantastically interesting phenotype as well. Um, Did you try growing them on like, like a plate or expressing a fair? With the flocculating strains that I showed at the beginning, the flow one strains? Um, yeah, they would form pretty horrible colonies unless I was repressing the the flow one gene, uh, and then. But most of the experiments we did way back when we were doing that flow one overexpression was um, was mostly focused on we would keep the colony not we would turn off flow one in colony growth and then switch it on specifically for the um, exponential growth phase so that we could then get those um, pictures of the different. Uh, tubes with the pellet forming over time. First dimensional uh, Tom, so I guess another question relates to the growth-based patterning. I was wondering, is there is there a particular advantage to to doing kind of growth-based as opposed to kind of uh, cell patterning techniques? You know, essentially printing cell type printing patterns that people have done, um, like Zetzler and his lab at UCSF, for example. You know, where you have your pattern and you just print the cells, even different types of cells and things like this. Is there? Well, so one of the justifications for doing this project, and actually it's kind of cool because the funding agency, the Leverhulme Trust, who are this nice charity in the UK, they, they actually encourage you to submit projects that you, know, you can't have a good justification for. Like in terms of commercial, they, they say you know, their remit is to fill the gaps between other research councils for the interesting cross-disciplinary things. But we did, we do think that in 2D growth, a growing branched fractal is one of the highest surface areas. And a lot of what you need for you know, testing out things in metabolic engineering might require good surface areas, so good secretion, as opposed to if you grow the cells as a single 2D colony, they're just gonna grow on top of each other. Now, if you were to print the cells in a 2D, uh, branch fractal, we're still going to want them to keep growing because we, you know all of these pathways run best when the cells are growing pretty well, right? So they will just start growing and they'll start growing on top of each other, filling in the gaps, right? And so there will be dead zones, there will be areas in the middle where the existing cells are no longer exchanging nutrients because they're surrounded by other cells, so they don't have access to the full surface area. <coughs> Yes, a, a detail about what you said quite quickly about the peroxisomes. 
that would deliver uh, uh, penicillin directly at the cell membrane. So I think in yeast it's unconventional that peroxisome would fuse directly to yes. the cell membrane. So is it that you are meaning it as an indirect path? Yeah, so yeah, I did miss, I said that wrong. If I go back to the pathway. It actually here they, they do they don't go at like the peroxisome doesn't fuse and the whole thing empties out. It it diffuses from the peroxisome out into the cell. But the overexpression of the peroxisomes led to much higher levels, that may be because there's much more uh, catalysis going on because we have bigger peroxisomes, or it may be because now there's more peroxisomes closer to the membrane, so it's coming out a lot more. But the ratio between uh, product that was secreted uh, versus not secreted went up when we increased the peroxisome. So, 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 so that means that there is a mechanism to transport the penicillin from the cytoplasm to uh, the outside. Yeah. Um, is this part of the machinery that you, that no. you, you know, it's not new? That's something that occurs in yeast? Yeah. Okay. A question to you, or uh, Francois. Do you think that this is a peroxisome uh, merged with the membrane that induces the formation of filamentous? Um, I'm not sure that the, those two things are related. The, these, these don't form filaments in this project. Uh, this is a bit different. Having said that, the, the big penicillin producer P. chrysogeum is a filamentous fungi, and it grows as filament, so that it can have good surface area. Because the genes that, yes, that, that induce are in, involved in the lipid formation. Okay. I mean, the question, question mark. No, is, are the genes that induce filamentous? Um, well, I, I'll have to go and look that one up. I don't know if anyone here knows what the PEX11 is involved in lipids. Okay, uh, thank you. Why don't we take a five-minute break, and then we'll...